Welcome. We begin this evening with an acknowledgement. The Department of Asian Languages and Literature, along with the University of Washington, acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land that we currently occupy and upon which we carry out our work of scholarship and teaching. As humanistic scholars, we recognize that this land acknowledgement is but one small act in the ongoing process of confronting difficult realities and of striving to be in a just relationship with the land, its historical occupants and stewards and their descendants. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the 23rd Andrew L. Marcus Memorial Lecture, Half Bird, Half Fish, The New Grammar of Time Past in 17th Century Tamil, Telugu, and Sanskrit by Professor David Shulman. My name is Zev Handel, and I'm the current chair of the Department of Asian Languages and Literature, and I'm delighted to be with you on this lovely evening in Seattle where the sun has not yet set. Before our speaker is introduced, I'd like to say a few words about Andrew Marcus, for whom this wonderful series of lectures is named and in whose memory it is carried forward. Andrew Lawrence Marcus was born in New Haven, Connecticut, and educated as a child in American and European schools. He graduated summa cum laude from Harvard College in 1975 with a BA in East Asian Languages and Civilizations. After studying early modern Japanese literature at Keio University in Tokyo, Andrew Marcus received his doctoral degree from Yale University in 1985 with a dissertation on the 19th century Japanese writer Ryute Tanehiko. After serving briefly on the faculty of the University of Kansas, he came to the University of Washington in 1986 and taught classical Japanese language, literature, and culture here in our Department of Asian Languages and Literature. He was promoted to the rank of associate professor with tenure in 1992, the same year that his monograph on Tanehiko, titled The Willow in Autumn, was published by the Harvard University Asia Center. A review of the book that appeared in the Journal of Japanese Studies lauded it this way. Anyone with firsthand experience of the difficulty of the texts Marcus discusses will find his expertise daunting. The review went on to say that this book, quote, will be a rich source of ideas for students of late Edo Japan for years to come. The time and effort Marcus put into the book will pay off handsomely in intellectual dividends." Unquote. Sadly, Professor Marcus was unable to enjoy the satisfaction of seeing a generation of scholars and students benefit from his singular work of scholarship. He passed away in October of 1995. First with a symposium held the following year, and then through this annual series of lectures given since 1998, the generosity of Andrew Marcus family and friends has permitted the department to remember him and to commemorate his legacy as a scholar and a teacher by inviting leading researchers from around the world to speak on topics related to Asian languages, literatures, and cultures. The unbroken annual series of lectures was disrupted last year, as so many aspects of our lives have been by the COVID-19 pandemic, which first hit Seattle last spring. But I'm pleased to say that the 2020 lecture was not canceled, merely postponed. We are very fortunate that last year's scheduled speaker, Professor David Shulman, is still available this year to participate from half a world away. On behalf of the department, I would like to express deep gratitude to Professor Marcus' family and friends for making possible this very special annual event, which has over two decades truly become one of our department's most cherished traditions. Before we begin, I'd like to explain how things are going to work in this Zoom webinar. Following Professor Shulman's address, we will have a question and answer session moderated by Professor Joe Marino. 
To pose a question, click on the icon labeled Q and A at the bottom of your screen, then enter your question in the window. We will not be using the Zoom chat feature, so be sure to click on Q&A and not on chat. Feel free to pose questions at any time, including during Professor Schulman's remarks. Note that you will not be able to see questions that have been posed by others until they are moderated. We will let the questions accumulate until it is time for the question and answer session, and then we will get to as many of them as we have time for. And now I would like to invite Professor Emeritus Richard Solomon, who just last week received the high honor of being elected to the prestigious American Academy of Arts and Sciences to introduce our distinguished speaker. Rich? Uh, thank you, Zev, and uh, thanks to everyone for tuning in this evening. Great pleasure for me to introduce David Schulman, who is uh, a friend and colleague of many, many years standing. Uh, our paths have uh, run in something like parallel and occasionally intersecting tracks for uh, almost our whole careers, uh, including uh, a year that I spent together with David in Jerusalem in, I believe it was 1980, 88 and 89, which was extremely fruitful for, I hope, for both of us. Uh, anyway, uh, David is the Rene Lang Professor Emeritus at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He has taught at Hebrew University since 1977 in various capacities, and uh, during that period also served as chairman of the Institute for Asian and African Studies and the director of the Institute for Advanced Studies between 1992 and 1998. Uh, he holds a PhD in Tamil literature from SOAS, that is a School of Oriental and African Studies in London. Uh, he earned a degree in 1976 studying under John Marr. Um, his many honors are really too much, uh, too many to listen uh, to list. Uh, I'll just mention uh, no, most notably for an American audience, the MacArthur Fellowship that he earned in 1987. Uh, and much later in his career, 2016, he earned the Israel Prize, which is uh, probably less familiar to some of you, but as big a deal over there as a MacArthur Fellowship is over here. And between those two, we accumulated a bunch of other honorary degrees from the University of Chicago and the University of Hyderabad and uh, was elected to the Israel Academy of Science and Humanities in 1998 and many others, but that will suffice. Uh, David is the acknowledged master of the pre-modern and early modern literary and cultural traditions of South India, uh, particularly in fields of poetry and mythology and others as well, including music. Uh, he's best known, I suppose, for his expertise in the languages and, literature in Tamil and Telugu, uh, but he actually has a rare combination of mastery of not just those languages, but of all four of the major Dravidian literary languages, as well as last but not least Sanskrit. I don't know any other scholar who can cover all that ground. Uh, his publications are beyond number. I started counting his books. Uh, when they got up into the dozens, I stopped counting. I think, uh, uh, you get the idea. And I just picked somewhat randomly examples of a few uh, titles of his uh, books, uh, some, uh, some of the well known, more better known uh, publications, including The King and the Clown in South Indian Myth and Poetry back in 1985, uh, The Hungry God, Hindu Tales of Philicide and Devotion, 1993, More Real Than Real, A History of Imagination in 2014, uh, Innovations and Turning Points Toward History of Kavya Literature in 2014. Uh, a favorite of mine is called Mavono Shafat Ha'elim, which means Introduction to the Language of the Gods, which, as you might guess, is a textbook for Sanskrit via Hebrew. So uh, that's uh, recommended for people who like linguistic challenges, like doing them the hard way. Um, there's another publication I would like to uh, mention of his, which is called uh, a book published in 2007 called Dark Hope, Working for Peace in Israel and Pakistan. Uh, sorry, 
in Israel and Palestine, uh, which is representative of his inner, his tireless and devoted and passionate uh, devotion to that the cause represented in, in that book. David's works are unfailingly creative, insightful, and original, as would no doubt will be his talk for tonight. His talk for us tonight will be. I sorely regret that he can't be joining us in person person this evening or this morning for him, uh, but I can guarantee you will enjoy the talk and profit from our long distance meeting. Thank you for coming, David. Over to you. Good evening, everybody. Uh... Actually, it's morning, six o'clock in the morning here in Jerusalem, uh, which I think means that um, from your point of view, I'm now in the future. Uh, and from my vantage point, I can tell you that the future looks a lot like the past. Um, although that's not always the case, and indeed the subject of my talk tonight is going to have something to do with that, <clears throat> with the notion of time past, time future, a new relation to the past, a new grammar of time. Um, I'm very happy to be with you. It's a great honor for me to be giving the Marcus Memorial Lecture. Um, I'm really sorry I can't be there in person, but perhaps someday that will happen again. Um, so let me, uh, let me uh, just get into my, uh, my topic. I'm going to be talking tonight um, actually, I'm going to be telling you a story about a poet, a Tamil or Telugu poet called Nakira. You're going to see his name in just a moment uh, on the screen. Um, Nakira, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, sources from the 16th and 17th century, which tell his story. He was a great poet who, to his chagrin, discovered at some point in rather traumatic circumstances, that everything that he had ever written, all of the great poems for which he was famous were now entirely passé. And that if he wanted to go on writing poetry, he was going to have to um, basically invent a new kind of language and a new kind of poetics. And um, uh, I'm going to take you through the way, um, the way this happened to him. Uh, I also want to say that this story is a story about time and different kinds of time, old time, new time, um, maybe a kind of unstructured emergent um, new time, maybe a combination of all these different temporal rhythms. Um, and I'm going to begin by giving you a a uh, few uh, introductory notes, and then we'll launch into the story of Nakira. Uh, let me share the screen to be sure that you can see my handout. One moment. Yeah. So I hope everybody can see that. Is that okay? Any sign from? Show that this is visible to everybody. Is that okay? It looks great. Okay, great. Okay. So um, let me say a, a few words of introduction to the story, then we'll launch into the story of Nakira. You see his name there on the text, Nakira in Tamil. Uh, he's called Natkira in Telugu. Uh, he was the president of the Tamil Academy of Arts and Sciences, as you'll hear in a moment. Um, the story is, I'm going to narrate it to you, comes from a moment of very uh, far reaching, even revolutionary cultural change throughout all the cultures of Southern India. Um, in fact, I think it would be fair to say that by this time, by the 16th century, the Tamil, Telugu, Kannada, Malayalam worlds were all part of a single kind of cultural ecosystem. And we see in all of them the evidence of a radical shift uh, in all the major domains and parameters. So um, just to say a couple of words about that, um, we have a new kind of politics and a new kind of state that includes the 
uh, mobilization of a new political elite from groups that were hitherto um, rather marginalized in the social periphery. Uh, these new states were based on a new kind of economy, a cash economy, a fully um, cash e economy, which was something relatively new in South India in the 16th century. Um, along with the economic and political uh, domains, we have the emergence of a new audience for um, the artistic or expressive works, literature, painting, sculpture, theater, um, dance, um, music. And um, in all of these domains, we see evidence of a very major shift. Actually, it comes down in a way, we're not going to have time to talk about the political and economic uh, side anymore, but um, it comes down in a way to a very radical shift in taste, or one could say in sensibility. So let me say just a word or two about that. Um, first of all, I have to say I uh, agree with what the Russian poet Osip Mandelstam said about taste. He said, it is not faith, but taste that moves mountains. And what we see in all of the literatures and other expressive domains of the South in this period, which you might call the early modern period, what we see is the appearance of new artistic and expressive modes which are based upon a different sensibility. You might ask, how is it that we actually know there was a shift in taste? So I'm going to mention a couple of things. First of all, it's not so hard to know. Uh, all it takes really is to look at uh, two or three of the poems. You'll see it yourself. I'll give you the opportunity in just a few moments. You can come to your own conclusion. But the story that I'm going to tell you, Nakira's story, is all about this question of a new sensibility, a new kind of taste. There are a couple of important indicators um, that help us um, to make sense of this shift in taste and also perhaps to understand where it came from. So, you know, I think one might say that uh, in every generation, uh, there is an attempt and a need, a cultural collective need, to reimagine the links to the past, to reconceive the past. It's a universal phenomenon, and um, I think we find it everywhere. But uh, there are periods where that shift in the perspective on the past becomes a major cultural theme. You can think of moments like um, the 12th and 13th century in Florence and Siena and, v and uh, Venice. Um, there was a moment like that in Iran in the 14th century under the Ilkhanid rule. Um, one could talk about the mid 18th century French diarists who basically invented modern history and historiography as we know it. Um, one could go on like that and look for other such periods, but it's very clear that in the 16th and 17th century in South India, we have a period like that in which the past has to be um, radically reconceived. Um, you'll see how this happens in our story in just a few moments. There's another important indication which might be a little more surprising. Um, and that has to do with grammar. Um, or with a process that I'm going to call re-grammaticalization. It's a big heavy word. And what it means is that grammar in the wide sense of the word, not just the uh, nuts and bolts of uh, morphology and uh, phonology and so on, but grammar in the sense of a linguistic paradigm for all scientific endeavors. Um, grammar in that <clears throat> wide sense had to be um, uh, very uh, radically reconceived. It's um, important to say this because in India, I suppose many of you know this, in India, um, the queen of sciences was not mathematics, as it's usually considered to be in the West, but grammar. Grammar was the paradigm, both in terms of structure and also in terms of the conceptual ordering of the materials, it begins with the, the great grammar of Sanskrit by Panini, from the middle of the first millennium BC. Um, Panini, you could say, set the paradigm. Uh, 
Um, and what we see in our period, not surprisingly for people who know South India, is um, an attempt to reorder, reconceive, reimagine the science of grammar um, in all of the major um, parameters. That is to say, uh, the nuts and bolts of, and bolts of uh, linguistic science, but also grammar in the sense of the grammar of poetics and aesthetic experience, which has always had a deep uh, connection to um, the, linguistic, uh, the linguistic order. So what we see um, in this same period and in the South uh, is a series of great linguists, grammarians, um, who first of all reordered Sanskrit Paninian grammar. These are names like Batoji Dikshita, and uh, there was a whole family of grammarians in the Deccan in South India, uh, Batoji, uh, Kaundabhatta, my own personal favorite, uh, a generation later, Nagoji Bhatta. These people uh, offered a new vision of what Sanskrit grammar was. And um, they also extended the grammar to topics that had previously been relatively marginalized. For example, syntax and semantics. You'll see the relevance um, of, uh, of this notion in just a moment. Um, like the Sanskrit grammarians, uh, who in a way set the um, model for uh, the new grammars, we have new grammars of language and poetics in, San in Tamil from the 16th and 17th century, uh, very far-reaching re far uh, radical revisions of what language is all about, similarly in Telugu, in Kannada, and in Malayalam. Um, you could say that the revolution in taste that I'm going to be talking about uh, is really an attempt to produce a new grammar of beauty or of meaning. So um, these things go hand in hand. The uh, attempt to reimagine the cultural past, the need to re-grammaticalize the scientific and erudite domains in general, and the new sensibility in taste, which we see embodied in the story of Nakira. Okay, just a word or two about the setting. Um, so Nakira uh, actually belongs to the city of Madurai in the far south of the Tamil country. Um, he's a semi-historical figure in the sense that we know the name already from very early Tamil poems, uh, the so-called Sangam poems, because the city of Madurai um, was the site of the Sangam, that is to say the um, Academy of Tamil uh, language and literature, at least according to the tradition. Um, that Sangam is supposed to have included 48 poets plus one. That one is the god Shiva, the god Shiva of Madurai Sundareshvara, uh, who became a poet himself. And these 49 poets, um, they had seats on a kind of raft or plank, uh, which was floating in the waters of the golden lotus tank, uh, which um, is situated within the compound of the God's temple in Madurai. This plank had various miraculous properties. For example, a good poet, a real poet, would always find room on this plank, which could expand itself uh, infinitely. But if a mediocre poet, or of course a bad poet tried to climb onto the plank, the plank would unceremoniously dump him back into the waters of the tank. So we had a kind of um, golden standard, you might say, of poetic or aesthetic excellence. Among these 49 poets, we have Nakira, or Natkira, the president of the uh, Academy of Tamil Sciences, and a great poet in his own right, whose poems we know from the ancient Sangam anthologies. You'll be, um, you'll be meeting Nakira in a rather more personal mode in just a moment. Um, the story is going to begin in Madurai, but most of it is focused 
on the very beautiful temple site of Kalahasti at the northern boundary of the Tamil country today. Actually, it's the boundary between Tamil and Telugu speech. This is a temple called Sri Kalahasti. Um, you can see a miniature picture of it there. Um, it's a mixed zone of Telugu and Tamil speech. And in fact, we have versions of the Nakilar story, both in Tamil and in Telugu. The earlier one is by a poet called Durjati, whose name you see here. Durjati wrote a book called the Sri Kalahasti Mahatmyamu, that is to say, a compilation of the stories about the temple of Kalahasti, uh, how the gods came to be there and various things that happened there. He's also the author of a very beautiful collection of personal poems called the Sri Kalahastishvara Shatakamu, a century of poems dedicated to Lord Shiva. Uh, you'll be hearing more about that in a moment. Um, the Tamil version of his story follows very closely upon Dhorjati's Telugu version. And it's my great poet, whose name is Dure Mangalam Siva Prakasa Swamihal. I'm sorry, but Tamil names, indeed, the South Indian names generally, uh, they tend to be rather long. I'm just going to call him Siva Prakasa. His book, the Sikhalati Puranam, one of the masterpieces of 17th century Tamil, tells the story of Nakirar with the same themes that I've already mentioned, that is to say, the renewed relation to the past, the attempt to um, re-grammaticalize Tamil and aesthetic experience. Um, and um, he does this in a way which you'll be able to sample in just a moment from the verses that I'm going to read with you. There's also a Sanskrit version of this story, probably from the 15th century from Madura in the south. It's called the Halasya Mahatya. And I'll have occasion to mention it again in a few moments. Okay, so we're going to launch into the Nakira story. I'm going to follow a, a kind of mixed version from the Telugu and the Tamil texts. Um, just to give you a sense of how the story is told. And um, I think you'll see for, uh, for yourselves how this theme of reinventing a language or recreating a, an entire literature uh, is conceived in the 16th and 17th centuries. So let's begin um, with um, a brief description of the Pandya king of Madurai. Madurai, as I just said, it was the seat of the Tamil Academy of Sciences. And as it happened, it had a king who, as kings should be, had a kind of profound relationship to the Tamil language and Tamil poetry. He was a connoisseur of Tamil poetry. And the authors also tell us a few other things about this king. He, I'm reading to you uh, from the verse that I hope you can see. He, the Pandya king, had an army vast as the ocean and a tongue that knew how to lie to long-eyed women when they were pretending to be angry. He also knew about giving Brahmins bracelets of fine gold when they sang their mantras at weddings. Um, he was a good king. I think it's perhaps a little interesting in a story that's all about poetry and language uh, to highlight the fact that he was good at lying to beautiful women when they were pretending to be angry. Um, actually, the commentators tell us that there are various occasions uh, where lying is perfectly okay. For example, during weddings, while making love, when there is danger to life, and when one's possessions are about to be stolen, also when speaking to Brahmins. So here is a king who knew how to lie to women. And I thought, that since, it's, uh, since this is mentioned already at the very outset of our stories, I might um, give you a Tamil poem from the early period of the Sangam, which also has uh, something of this same idea. I'm giving you this poem also so that you'll have a kind of reference point to what's coming afterwards. So here's a poem from one of the ancient Tamil anthologies called Kurum Dohai. Um, it's a love poem. The speaker is the Talaivi heroine or beloved. And she says the following. She says, my lover, capable of terrible lies, at night lay close to me in a dream that lied like truth. I woke up still deceived and caressed the bed, thinking it my lover. 
It's terrible. I grow lean in loneliness, like a water lily gnawed by a beetle. Um, this is a translation by the great poet translator A.K. Ramanujan. And in some ways, it's a rather typical old Tamil love poem. Keep it in mind as we progress. Uh, for those of you who may know a bit about Tamil, let me just say that there are uh, a few signs embedded in this rather laconic, I think, beautiful poem, which should tell us something about the love relationship and the particular phase that it is in and the landscape in which it unfolds. That's the ancient Tamil grammar of love poetry. Um, and it's exactly that kind of poetry that um, our hero Nakira is going to have to reject and supersede. So you know something about the Pandya king. You know that he liked Tamil poems. Um, and things were okay for a while, but then a disaster happened. There was a terrible drought in the Madurai Pandya country. Here's how the poet Durjati um, describes it. Saturn entered Pisces, a comet appeared in the east, clouds massed at noon. There were early morning sprinkles every day, but by night the skies were clear. The sun shone dimly and heavy breezes blew, but real rain never came. The new moon was shorter at one end. Even thunder was silent except in the south, the realm of death the monsoon failed. As the famine became worse, people lost hope of surviving. Many died burning with hunger. A few fled to other countries just to stay alive. It was the state of man eat man. So it was a terrible time. It was so terrible um, that even if you were a very wealthy person, there was nothing you could buy, including food. And that's something that you should keep in mind because um, uh, as you'll see in just a moment, this question of money, remember that new cash economy is also relevant to our story. One day, one evening really, uh, in the course of this terrible time, the king, the Pandya king, went for a walk in his garden. It was springtime. And he was um, enjoying the beautiful uh, flowering of the trees and particularly the fragrance of the new blossoms. And as he was breathing in this fragrance, an idea came to him, a kind of query in his own mind. And he said to himself, <clears throat> I wonder what is more fragrant, <clears throat> these um, fragrances of the garden and the flowers <clears throat> excuse me, or the um, fragrant hair of my wife, the queen. He couldn't decide, and so he decided that he would put this question to a test. And um, he, he took a, a bag of a thousand golden coins, tied it at the entrance to this Sangam uh, Academy of Tamil Sciences. And he said that any poet, any of the great 48 or 49 poets of the Sangam, any poet who was able to somehow uh, empathically imagine the question that was in his mind, the king's mind, would get this um, bag of gold. So the Tamil poets uh, began to compose poems each of them trying to imagine what the king was thinking of, but none of them came anywhere close to actually um, uh, articulating this question that was in the Pandya king's mind. Um, I should tell you, by the way, that these poets, they're said to have been engaged in trying um, to create a new kind of Tamil poetry. Um, new kinds of compositions, which are called tuki, and they were given to experimentation. Um, but as you can see, they were not quite able to succeed in this particular case. However, there was a, there was a man, a poor Brahmin man, and his name was Tarumi. You can see the name on the handout. And Tarumi, even in this terrible time, wanted to get married. And as everybody knows, getting married um, is a 
fairly expensive proposition. He had no money. So he did the practical thing. He went into the temple of the god, Lord Shiva, Sundareshvara, the beautiful god. That's what his name means in Madurai. And he said to, he said to Shiva, he can't, he said, I can't, um, I can't survive here. I'm going to have to leave this country and I want to get married. Um, I have no recourse but you. And Shiva said, well, actually there is a solution. He said, um, the Pandya king has just uh, hung a bag of a thousand golden coins on the entrance of the Sangam building. And uh, he'll give these coins to whoever brings a poem that uh, manages to formulate a particular thought in his mind. And since I'm God, said Lord Shiva, since I'm God, uh, actually I know what was in the king's mind and I'll give you such a poem. You can take the poem and sing it in the academy and they'll give you the thousand golden coins. You'll notice that there's a bit of a paradox here because uh, as I just told you, um, there was nothing that money could buy in Madurai. That paradox has a certain um, poignancy in the context of what is about to happen. So Lord Shiva gave him, um, gave him a poem. Uh, we'll read the poem in just a second. I should tell you that this is a real poem that we know from the ancient Sangam anthologies. It's, um, it's from the Kurundagai anthology, the second poem, and it's attributed to a poet whose name is Irayanar, which means God. And um, again, it's a classical uh, Tamil love poem. It's addressed to a bee, and here the speaker is the male lover. Uh, it's a famous poem, Kongutir Vargai Anchirai Tumbi. Here's a translation of it. You who spend your life in flight, seeking a hidden sweetness, don't tell me what I want to hear. Tell me what you really see. I love a woman, love everything about her, the way she walks, just like a peacock, her teeth. Her long dark hair, more fragrant, I think, than any flower, but only you can say. So this is the poem that the god Shiva gave to the poor Brahmin Tarumi to recite in the academy. And as you can see, the poem perfectly embodies the query that the Pandya king had in his mind, which is more fragrant the hair of the queen or the flowers on uh, the budding trees. So, Tarumi takes this poem into the Sangam, recites the poem in the presence of the king who immediately recognizes that this poem is exactly, um, exactly corresponds to the thought in his mind. And he says to Tarumi, you can take the golden coins and just as Tarumi is about to cut down the bag of gold uh, from the entrance to the Sangam, at that very moment, our friend Nakira, the president of the academy, intervenes and says, wait a minute, he says, there's a flaw in this poem. Um, you have to remember that Tarumi was a poor Brahmin, he had no idea about poetry whatsoever. <clears throat> had no particular um, aesthetic taste. Uh, he had no idea what the flaw could possibly be. So very frustrated and angry. You can imagine how he felt. Uh, he rushed back into the temple of the God and he said, what have you done to me? You have given me a faulty poem. And Lord Shiva, um, Lord Shiva, uh, also a little angry at this. The poets say he dressed himself as a poet. I don't know exactly what that means uh, in 16th century uh, Tamil Nadu, but dressed as a poet, uh, he comes marching into the Academy of Sciences and he asks loudly, who has found fault with my poem? And Nakira, the president of the Academy immediately says, it is I. You can read one version of the discussion between Shiva and Nakira from um, Durjati's text in Telugu. Who finds fault with my poem? This is God speaking. 
Nikira says, it is I. The God says, and what exactly is the flaw? Nikira um, says, actually, usually uh, in the Tamil version, he says, it's not a flaw in the phonology. It is not a flaw in the morphology. It's a flaw in the third crucial part of grammar, the most important part of the grammar, namely what is called porul, which means um, meaning or substance. And uh, he spells it out. Nakira says, women's hair is never naturally fragrant. They have to do something to it to make it smell good. Something like putting flowers in their hair. Oh, says the God, and what about the hair of the goddesses in heaven? There are a lot of beautiful goddesses in heaven and also the Apsaras dancers. What about their hair? And Nakira says the same applies to them. You know, um, Nakira, he's a kind of archetypal um, professor. Professors are kind of like that. They have, an, a, they, I think they have this tendency to dig in their feet um, in a pedantic way. And that's what's happening to Nakira, the president of the academy. And now the God says to him, and what about the hair of my wife, the goddess in the temple at Sri Kalahasti? So I have to tell you that the name of the goddess and Kalahasti is a very beautiful name. Her name is in Tamil, Jnana Pungkodai, in Telugu, Jnana Prasunambika. That means the lady whose hair is fragrant with wisdom. Um, some of you might think that uh, wisdom is not something that actually has a fragrance to it, but um, I'd like you to begin to assimilate the South Indian way of thinking about things. And there's no question in South India, wisdom too is a fragrant substance. And the goddess, her hair is fragrant with wisdom. But Nakira says, she too, the hair of the goddess of Sri Kalahasti, the goddess whom I worship, says Nakira, uh, her hair has no natural fragrance at all. Um, by now, Shiva is getting kind of angry, <clears throat> more angry than he was before. And he happens to have um, a third eye in the middle of his forehead. Um, that eye is usually closed, luckily, because when he opens it, it burns whatever he looks at. And he opens it when he gets angry. And he's becoming angry now at Nakira and his obstinate refusal to accept the poem. And so he begins to open the eye and Nakira begins to feel a kind of heat burning around him, but he is still obstinate. And he says to the God, even if you had a thousand eyes all over your body and you opened every one of them and they were fiery with flames, even then a mistake is still a mistake. Sound familiar to you? But by then the eye is completely open and, the, and Nakira in order to avoid being incinerated, has to jump into the waters of the golden lotus tank at the temple. And that's not all, because when he comes out of the water, Shiva, still very angry, curses him. He says to him, you are going to become a leper. And for the rest of your life, you're going to wander as a leprous beggar all over the world. And now for the first time in this story, Nakira seems to have some sense of what has happened and the cost of his mistake. And he begs the God, he begs the God to give him some hope, some exit from this terrible curse. His body is already becoming leprous. The skin of his fingers is peeling away. Um, his face is distorted. He begs for forgiveness and Shiva says to him, he relents and he says, okay, um, when you come to Mount Kailasa, that's where the God lives. Shiva's home is on Mount Kailasa in the far north today in Tibet. You come to Mount Kailasa, the curse will come to an end. I hope everybody's still with me. Nakira, um, he has a moment where uh, of, of traumatic separation from his entire world, from the other 47 poets of the Sangam, 
from the god of Madurai, from the goddess of Madurai, from the literature to which he had given his life, from the Tamil language, which is his language. He, um, he says goodbye. First of all, he says to the poets, he says a beautiful thing. He says, one doesn't need to share the same space for deathless friendship. It's enough to share the same deep feeling. I'm going now all alone. Actually, it's kind of important that he's alone. He's sick and disfigured. And the fact that he's alone has meaning. I'll come back to that in just a second. And he has a kind of lamentation as he leaves. He says, when will I ever see Madurai again? And Saundarayan's blessed feet, that's the god of Madurai Shiva, the author of our poem. When, what day will I see our mother, that is the goddess, Minakshi? Will I meet again this king of kings with his triumphant spear? And my closest friends, dear as the breath of life itself in the Sangam, when, oh when, will I see them? And off he goes. He goes on a long trip. Um, it's a very peculiar trajectory. We won't follow him. Uh, it's a matter of walking um, for thousands of kilometers over several years. First he walks northward, actually comes to the Himalaya mountains. He's not that far away from Kailasa, which is supposed to mark the end of his curse, but he doesn't go there. Instead he heads south again. He bathes in the sacred rivers. He worships at every possible temple. Uh, he reaches a point where he can no longer walk. His body is uh, disintegrated and he can only roll on the ground. Um, and um, all this time passes and eventually, eventually he comes to a rather beautiful lake um, somewhere in India. Um, he's ravished by the beauty of this lake. Remember, Nakira was a poet, a great poet. Once he was a great poet. He writes a poem, composes a poem. We're not talking about writing poems down. He composes a poem, uh, a kind of naturalistic um, observation. Let's read it. Um, he's looking at this lake and he says, a gander was at a loss how to appease his angry mate until she heard the shriek of a kingfisher diving down to catch a fish. And she was scared, so scared that the gander was able to embrace her with his silken wings. Um, I hope you can see that something's happening to Nakira. It's kind of different from the two Sangam poems that we read earlier, the two ancient Tamil poems, something new is happening. And in particular, I might just say in a parenthesis that this is a period when naturalistic observation, sometimes very meticulous observation, becomes very widespread in all the South Indian literatures. And there's the figure which is called Svabhavokti, that is to say naturalist, naturalistic description. This verse um, with the goose, the, ganger, the gander, and the kingfisher um, falls into that category. And if I had time, I would have a lot to tell you about this particular figure because it has changed its um, nature in the course of time. By the way, you might uh, keep in mind also that we saw the same interest in naturalistic observation in that poem um, uh, by, uh, by Shiva recited by the poor Brahman Dharumi uh, in which um, uh, Nakira objected to the fact that um, women's hair could even be considered to be naturally, uh, naturally fragrant. So you can see that this notion of a kind of naturalistic observation is beginning to take on and that's part of the new world that is beginning to unfold. Now there's something else. He sees this lotus pond. Let's see what he sees. Nakira saw lotus palm, dusted with pollen like pervasive passion, fragrant like hidden memories from former births, buds unfolding like layers of our bodily being, waves rippling like conflicting desires, an image of life itself. Geese played there like yogis immersed in God. It was deep beyond imagining, complete and singular, like truth. And on its bank stood a huge banyan tree. 
Now listen carefully. In its shade, Natkira rested peacefully. As he watched, sitting there, the leaves from that tree that fell down on the open ground became birds. And those that fell into the water became fish. But one leaf fell half in water and half on land, half fish, half bird. It pulled both inward and outward. Natkira lost himself in the feeling of wonder. Watching this, the great poet who knew how to make sense of the perfect rules of Augustus' grammar was transfixed with amazement and terribly alone. Um, I, um, I gave this lecture the title, Half Fish, Half Bird, now you know why. And you can imagine that single singular leaf that fell just on the edge of the water, half in the water and half on land, so that it was divided into two halves that were pulling in opposite directions. And this was something amazing to Nankira. He was completely lost in the feeling of wonder. But it could be also that Nankira was seeing something that only he could see. Maybe some image of himself pulled in two directions. Somehow a poet of the ancient Tamil kind and also a new poet, not yet fully mature. And there are other ways we could describe this conflict of the fish and the bird, but for sure what we have is some image of something rather miraculous that is connected to this particular moment in the life of the Tamil language and Tamil literature. Interestingly, the poet highlights the fact that Nakira was a grammarian. He knew the perfect rules of Augustia's grammar, except that Augustia, the original grammarian in Tamil, is perhaps no longer relevant to what is happening to this poet. And he's terribly alone. And that really makes a difference because it seems that the new kind of poetry that Nakira is about to invent, I'm going to give you an example in just a second, that is a, poetry, a kind of poetry that he has to pull out of himself as a rather lonely, um, maybe discordant, maybe um, uh, somehow disjunctive individual. And in that moment of terrible aloneness, something else happens because there's a demon there, a huge, ugly, black demon uh, uh, he's also a hungry demon, and he picks up Nakira and pushes him into a cave where there are 999 other people. And when they see him, they burst into tears. And that's because this demon is a great, big, huge, hungry demon. He wants to eat them, but um, only a thousand human beings count as a mouthful of food for this demon. And Akira is the number 1000. And so these 999 people caught in the cave, they begin to cry and shout and scream that they're about to be eaten, all of them by this demon. But Nakira, remember he's in a rather bad state physically, somehow he still has the presence of mind to say, no, he says there's a way out. He says, I'm going to pray to the God Murugan, Subramania, that's the son of Lord Shiva. I'll pray to Murugan and ask him to come and save us. And he on the spot improvises a poem. We have this poem. It's a rather long ancient poem belonging to the late Sangam period. It's called in Tamil the Tiru Murugatrapadai, that is it's a poem to the god Murugan, asking him to save these thousand people from the demon to come and kill the demon and Murugan now, this is what happens when a good poem is, is sung. Murugan is immediately activated. He comes, he kills the demon in a second. He opens the cave and the thousand people inside um, exit safely. But Nakira has another poem in him that wants to be sung. Actually, there are two. Um, first of all, he says to Lord Murugan, 
who has just saved them, he says. Um, he says, I have a problem. Uh, I have to get to Kailasa because of Lord Shiva's curse. And I don't even know where it is. And I can't go any farther. And Lord Murugan has a good idea. He says, well, he says, my father, he said you should come to Kailasa, but he didn't specify which Kailasa. Maybe he meant the Southern Kailasa. That's one of the names of the temple side of Sri Kalahasti, which is where this story is said. Why don't you go to Kalahasti? It's not far away. And Nakira bathes in a river and when he emerges, the temple of uh, the temple of Sri Kalahasti, the southern Kailasa, has actually come to him. There's a uh, there's a Telugu proverb about that, which um, is relevant here because uh, in, in Telugu you can say um, you can say Kirtamu Arum Bovu Arum Bovu Apudu. Um, either is to say, uh, you're on your way to a temple pilgrimage and the temple comes to you. You can imagine in which uh, circumstances you might have use for a proverb like that. So the temple of Sri Kalahasi actually comes itself running, moving to Nakira. And when Nakira sees it, he sings a, po a poem. We have this poem, it's part of the uh, South Indian Shaiva Tamil canon of poems, which is called uh, Kailasa Padi Kalati Tirukalati Padi Andadi. That is, it's a poem half about Kailasa and half about Sri Kalahasti. I'm going to read you one verse from this poem, verse number two. Um, what Nakira says is the following From the moment I was born, I was wondering if my birth was something of worth, a gift earned by former deeds. Now I have the real gift of serving the God poet's praise, his body graced with dancing serpents, the Lord of Kalati. Kalati is Kalahasti. I think all of you who are with me tonight should be able to see that this is a different kind of poem than everything we've seen before. Think of the Sangam poems that we read. Think about the dream that lies like truth think uh, about the poem about the question of whether the queen's hair is naturally fragrant or not. This is a different kind of poetry. We could characterize it, but I think you can see for yourselves. This is a poem that comes out of, out of some kind of personal feeling, maybe a kind of desperate feeling. It's the poem of a singular individual expressing something that uh, only he knows, and he knows it by virtue of his experience. And it's a poem, of course, directed to the god of the Sri Kalahasti temple. Look how the poet describes what has happened. The poet says, he, Nakira, was like a blemished jewel, polished and perfected. He became Murugan. He became the god, dipped in the river of gold. That's the river at Sri Kalahasti. Then he saw a blinding light that was the Lord himself, like seeing with his own eyes the meaning of a flawless poet's perfect poem. Another way to say this, this is to say that this poet who is now writing a new kind of poetry, composing a new kind of poetry, not describing something, very far from the old grammar of um, Tamil poetry, he's in a way actually become the poem, turned himself into the poem. And there's one last verse that he sings in the Telugu version of Dorjati, which I think all of us can identify with. He says to the God at this point, joy in life is never unmixed with pain. Joy in life is never unmixed with pain. That special happiness one gets by letting go of the world, make that mine. It's as if he were saying that he would like to experience at least once in his life, some kind of unadulterated joy, a joy that is not 
mixed with pain. And that too must be something that comes out of the personal experience of this poet who has suffered so severely and has now reached the point where he is creating a new kind of poem, a new kind of grammar, a new kind of aesthetic experience, and in a way, a new kind of inner self. Um, my time's about up. I'm just going to sum up in a few words what we've seen. First of all, I think you can see that there's, um, there's a kind of intoxicating sense of novelty. Something profound has happened to Nakira and to the poets um, who are telling his story and also to their new audience. It's not just a question of a new technique, that's also there, but really it's about how the poet has become himself or herself in a way previously unknown. Nakira is speaking to us in an individual voice, not unlike the voice of his author. And he speaks his own truth, which is a composite and hard won truth that hangs together as a whole could say that this is one way of describing that new grammar of beauty that I was talking about. And what is it that he says in this new mode? He says the two halves coalesce into a single entity. The two temples, Kailasa and Sri Kalahasti are the same, if you know how to see them. Just like the male and female parts of the God are fused and the devotee and his God have become each other. And the poem is also two halves that are one at odds on one level, fused, or at least complementary on another. Depends how you look at them and how you imagine them. I said to you before that it is Nakira himself who is a kind of half fish and half bird. You could also say that um, we have two, um, two grammars that have somehow come together, not in a harmonious way. We have the old grammar of Tamil poetry, which has been superseded, and the new grammar, which is just beginning to emerge. And not only that, the collapse of these kind of two semantic levels generates a third surpassing level experienced as space that is half filled and half empty, at once full and empty, factual and imagined, factual because and as imagined. You could also say that the two halves of the leaf, the fish and the bird, are a way of talking about Sanskrit and Tamil in their relationship. And you could also say that these two languages as they merge have produced a new third language, which is to say what we now call Tamil, in which Sanskrit is very deeply um, embedded. And all of this is there in miniature in the leaf torn in the two directions that perhaps only Nakira could see. He could see the two potentialities at odds with one another, that in between an unresolved state. And he saw that you cannot define the leaf in a manner that would exclude either potentiality. Good poetry may be something unthinkable. And we have the two ecosystems, one wet and one dry, one driving toward depth and the other toward the sky, two infinities locked together to create intense wonder, what is called in Sanskrit, chamatkara or atishaya. And there's danger on the other side of the leaf, those 999 plus one, a vision of completeness that could be the end or maybe the only possible ground for the true poem. So the old world lives on inside the new one and anyone with a good ear can hear it. I think I'd better stop here. Thank you for listening. All right, thank you so much, Professor Shulman for this wonderful talk. Uh, I'm Joe Marino, Assistant Professor of Buddhist Studies in the Department of Asian Languages and Literature. In a moment, we'll shift over to the Q&A section of the evening. Please feel free to continue to submit your questions via the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We'll try to get to as many as possible. 
First, I want to mention also to our students in the audience, both graduate and undergraduate, that we will also be hosting a separate seminar with Dr. Shulman on May 27th from 9 a.m. to 10.50 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, this will be a chance to talk further in an informal setting where we can focus on his papers toward a yoga of the imagination and how to bring a goddess into being through visible sound. So look out for a flyer circulating this coming week or reach out to me directly um, uh, for more information. Okay, I'll shift now over uh, to the Q&A. We have about 20 minutes. I'll be reading aloud to Dr. Shulman the questions that you all have posed in the Q&A box. Uh, so let's begin. All right, so our first question uh, says, thank you, Dr. Shulman. Uh, you mentioned grammar as the queen of the sciences rather than mathematics. I'm interested to know what the roots of shunyata, zero as a philosophy and as a number, mathematically. Uh, were there such roots within Sanskrit grammar? What can you elaborate about this? And thank you. Quite a big question to begin with. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> so without getting into the technicalities, let me just say, um, people always claim that uh, the idea of zero, the mathematical notion of zero came from India. Maybe there's a good Buddhist component to this, but in grammar, there is indeed um, the notion, very modern notion of what is called a zero suffix. Um, you need that zero suffix in the very specific context, grammatical context in order to explain or to generate the grammatical form. Uh, and in that sense, you could say that there is some kind of relation I suppose, between the grammatical notion of this uh, invisible zero uh, suffix added to a root and the mathematical notion of zero. All right, thank you. Um, next question is uh, about your methods. Uh, can you speak about the difference between the aesthetic grammars of Tamil and Telugu poetry and, and then Sanskrit poetry on the other hand? Uh, these grammars of beauty, as you called them, how do you juggle these different aesthetics or different different grammatical aesthetics in your own mind as you switch from reading and translating sans Sanskrit and translating Tamil and Telugu? Okay, so um, there are two two parts to that question. I think this question of how I happen to live and read and what happens to me when I read a Tamil poem or a Telugu poem or a Sanskrit poem. And then there's a question that you could call a historical or empirical question about the relation of these different grammars to themselves and as they evolved over time into one another. Let me begin with the second half of it because that's the maybe easier thing to, uh, to answer. Um, one of the unusual features of Tamil in relation to others, um, Indian languages in general, is that it had from very early on, maybe from the very beginning of Tamil, uh, it had its own poetic grammar. It's not a grammar which is completely, um, uh, let us say, um, remote from Sanskrit, quite the contrary. It was influenced by Sanskrit um, grammatical models. Uh, there's the ancient grammar, which is called the Tolkapiam, probably goes back to something like the first century BC or the first century AD, we don't exactly know. Um, but it does include, especially in that third portion of grammar, that is to say the uh, what's called purul, the grammar of meaning, um, which is also a, gr a grammar of aesthetic uh, uh, theory, it includes an entire grammaticalized universe of love poetry and war poetry. That's something um, rather unique to Tamil. And um, in fact, that old poetic grammar has survived right up until modern times. And there are even people today writing novels in Tamil who perhaps unconsciously uh, referred to these very ancient um, uh, ways of thinking about landscape and love and the techniques of suggestion and so on. However, this ancient Tamil grammar uh, went through a series of uh, profound um, changes over the course of time. Uh, to put it very simply, uh, sometime around the 10th to 11th century AD, uh, during the Chola period, the great period in South India, we can see how the old Tamil grammar somehow assimilated to itself uh, the grammar of Sanskrit poetics, especially as we know it from the work of the great poetician Dandin in his Kavya Dalsha, the mirror of poetry. 
Um, so we now have a kind of composite way of doing poetry, of doing figuration. One that is modeled, you could say, upon the logic of figuration in the Sanskrit tradition. Dundon himself was a Tamilian, he, was, uh, he lived in Kanchipur. Um, modeled on the Sanskrit uh, way of doing uh, figuration, but also somehow in a continuing conversation with the, the poetic techniques of the ancient Tamil grammar. That's a really unusual feature. Um, and uh, were we to follow through on this, we would be able to see very clearly, as I mentioned at the beginning, that by the time we reach the, um, what I'm calling the early modern period, the 16th and 17th centuries, there's again, an attempt, a new attempt to put these grammars together and to see how, how um, you can um, intensify the poetic effect by, uh, by combining them. So um, you could say that the question that you asked is actually a question that the Tamil scholars and poets and theoreticians ask themselves as well. And they produced really very fascinating answers to it. Um, those 16th and 17th century grammars that I mentioned before, although they're rather neglected today, um, I don't think um, there are many people actually take the trouble to actually learn how to read these grammars. They try to come to terms with exactly the kind of question that you've asked. The same applies mutatis um, mutandis um, for the Telugu, uh, Kannada, and Malayalam traditions. All of them had versions of this same kind of, um, let's call it uh, intellectual challenge. That is to say how to read a poem in one of these languages in the light of the pre-existing grammars and the new grammars that were being produced at this time. So, okay, that's the, um, that's the historical and empirical part. How I actually read is something which I'm not sure I'm capable of articulating. I mean, I uh, must say I identify with Nakira in the, um, um, how should I say it, in the, uh, uh, the transformation that he undergoes in the direction of actually not simply reading a poem or composing a poem, but actually becoming the poem uh, uh, in himself. And I sometimes feel that that indeed is how we are meant to read these poems. That is to say, not in a purely analytical or intellectual um, manner, not that I'm against that, of course, but that we need to experience the poem in our body in some our bodies in some kind of direct way. And in order to do that, um, actually, it helps to read these poems in India. Um, I sometimes teach my students, I used to teach a course in great books, and um, we uh, would always begin with uh, Plato's Symposium. These were first year BA students. Um, I discovered it was very easy to get them to see that the symposium was a book that was written for them and uh, directly about the questions that, bought, that you know, exercised them in their lives. But I used to say to them that there are two ways to understand the symposium. One is the short way and one is the long way. So um, the long way is to go to the library and to read the hundreds of books that have been written, commentaries studies of the symposium in various European languages and try to understand what Plato was trying to say on that basis. That's the long way. The short way is to learn Greek and to read the symposium in Greek, but that's not enough because there's what I sometimes call the Shulman principle, which is that you have to read the symposium in Greek, in Greece, in that light, on the seashore with that kind of food and wine and music and all the other things that go with it. And the same thing I think applies to India. So all I can say is that um, as one moves from one context to another, one linguistic context to another, one language to another, um, it has a lot to do, uh, in my mind at least, with the physical, sensual presence of being in these different landscapes and actually feeling the words, not only in their technical, or how should we call it, their semantic meaning, uh, their dimension of uh, grammaticalized meaning, but also in some deeper sense, which is, I think, an intuitive and um, bodily sense of those poems. Sometimes, I suppose, there are uh, tensions and conflicts that come out of that kind of method. Very inspiring answer. I think everyone's going to be buying plane tickets for a future <laughs> trip. Uh, the next question um, shifts gears here. Tamil poetry takes into account the aspect of geography. Do we see a change in how the poet handles it during this shift to a new poetic grammar, especially since he's on a pilgrimage? 
how does the description and role of landscape change? Uh, it's a very wonderful question, one I'm really happy um, to address. Glad that you asked that question. Um, the, um, of course, it's, it's well known that the ancient Tamil grammar approaches depended upon a division of the Tamil landscapes into five main uh, prototypical landscapes, each one of them correlated to some phase of the love relationship between uh, the hero and the heroine in this case. And um, that whole ancient Tamil grammar is, um, is suffused with this um, very powerful sense of landscape and what it means, and also with the principle that what you see outside in the landscape has to be correlated to internal states of mind and feeling. That's what's in Tamil called Ullurai Uvamam. It's a particular way of suggesting some kind of emotional state. That ancient notion of landscape has survived right up into the present day. Although, as I said earlier, it's quite possible that some of the modern novelists who um, actually refer to this, I'm thinking of um, somebody called Sundara Ramaswamy, wrote a, a famous book, usually considered one of the great modern Tamil novels called The Story of the Tamarind Tree. Uh, if you read Sundara Ramaswamy, you can see that the old Tamil landscape of love is still present there and he's able to use it in perhaps an unconscious um, elusive way. But in the period in which um, you know, that I've been talking about the 16th, 17th century, early modern period. The old Tamil landscapes have, um, how should I say, they've, they've been um, reconfigured. They've been shifted in a dramatic way and recombined, recombined in such a way that we get a new sense of highly realistic, um, naturalistic description. And that includes the mixing of elements from the different landscapes. And that mixture, which is a principle of Tamil po uh, poetics, it's called Kinai Mayakam in the old uh, form, that is the mixing of these two, of these um, typical landscapes, that principle of mixture um, produces an entirely new aesthetics. So that the old grammar doesn't work in the way that it did before. It only works on the basis of some kind of um, very uh, direct observation uh, of um, these uh, naturalistic um, innerscapes and landscapes that I tried to show in that. If you think of the, the poem about the goose and the gander, for example, it's just one minor example. There's a huge profusion of texts um, uh, devoted to this kind of meticulous uh, naturalistic description, so much so that I think one of the great themes of that period um, is um, it has to do with the discovery of the fact that the notion of nature per se, nature is a kind of autonomous rule bound domain with its own internal logic. That notion has suddenly become a very powerful, uh, a very powerful theme. I'd go so far as to say that possibly um, that kind of uh, conceptualization of nature appears in South India for the first time in this period. And it has to do with that kind of naturalistic uh, observation that, um, that I mentioned before. So we now find suddenly a rather large literature, uh, which I think we'd have to call scientific or proto-scientific, dealing with all kinds of things like, um, like uh, botany, uh, for example, like uh, medicine, um, like physics, it also has to do with conflicting temporalities, which are, uh, which are part of the thematics of this period and so on. All of this coming out of a new sense of um, what nature might actually mean and what the place of the human being within the natural world is. But um, the grammatical equivalent of this has to do with that um, new vision of what landscape actually consists of and the mixing of the old landscapes into a new configuration. Thank you. I'll just keep rolling as we have now only about nine minutes left. Uh, our next question, thank you so much for this lovely talk. It's a wonderful way to end the evening. I was wondering if you could expand on the statement that jnana has fragrance, um, perhaps manam fragrance, within the world of South Indian poetic and theological literature. Do you see shifts in the sense of scent in the early modern period in relation to the expansion of naturalistic reflection? Yeah, it's a little hard to answer that question. Um, I do want to say, I once wrote a, an essay about, uh, about sense, about, um, you know, uh, smells in, uh, in pre-modern India uh, generally. 
Uh, actually, it's a rather extensive topic because, uh, as I'm sure many of you know very well, um, smell is connected to memory. We also know from our own personal experience, there's nothing like a sudden whiff, getting a whiff of something uh, to uh, suddenly call up a whole world of associations. It's a very direct um, uh, experience. And we have the notion of vasana, uh, vasana, which means smell, but actually it's used in a sense of kind of karmic memory. The unconscious uh, reservoir of memories that each one of us carries within herself or himself and which are classed as a kind of fragrance, uh, but they are the memories that actually inform our consciousness um, and uh, structure, you could say, our, uh, our memory in general. So there's a lot to be said about, uh, about fragrance and smells in general in, in uh, India. And it's certainly the case that once one reads the South Indian uh, poetry with an eye uh, or an ear to those kinds of, um, those kinds of themes, uh, suddenly it's everywhere. You can see um, uh, you can see a, a tremendous sensitivity to fragrance, uh, unusual in some ways, perhaps if you uh, compare it to other literatures. Um, how does this undergo a, a shift or a change in the early modern period? It's a good question. I don't think I have a good answer for it yet. I can say that um, the medical literature does classify smells in a way which I don't think um, uh, we've seen before. Um, so uh, there's an astonishingly wide range of classifications, like the classifications of tastes in an analogous field. Right? Um, and I think that were we to begin to go into the scientific literature, and especially the medical Ayurveda uh, materials, and possibly also in botany, we might begin to see uh, that there is an attempt to systematize this notion of, uh, of smell. One thing that I can say, though, is that the, in the few examples that I gave you, you can see that in the literary field, um, uh, this is a theme, uh, an interesting theme, continuous with the very ancient um, poems, like the one from the Kurundagai anthology that I read, uh, but maybe a little different. Um, so I think there's, uh, there's a real possibility here for um, somebody who wants to enter into this domain and uh, see what we can say about smells in the 16th century. Great, thank you. I think we have time for one or two more. Um, hello, Professor Schulman. Could you speak a little bit about how the metaphor of the kingfisher catching the fish differs from how animals figure in metaphors in classical poetry? So this is from Jahnavi. Hello, Jahnavi. Uh, it's a lovely question. So I didn't really have time to go into it. Um, but um, that little verse, you know, a lot of these verses, they're uh, kind of little snapshots. They're, certain, they're like a kind of flash, almost like a haiku. That in itself is something rather new. And the notion, um, if you look back to that verse that I read, um, you can see that uh, there is a kind of thick emotional texture to it that comes immediately out of that naturalistic observation. I mean, what do we see? We see the kingfisher. By the way, the kingfisher himself is a very interesting figure. It's there in the ancient Tamil poetry. Suddenly, though, uh, there's, um, there's a whole world uh, of uh, figurative and associative allusions to kingfishers in the poetry of our period, the early modern period. What is the kingfisher? There's something about that kind of sudden swoop from above down into the um, down into the water to catch a fish, which has a kind of um, how should I say it? Has a kind of very dramatic plunge into some experiential mode, which is also a little violent, isn't it? It's almost you might say a kind of image of um, what we could call insight. And the goose, the gander, and the female goose, you can see they're also somehow connected to this moment. They're watching it and they're feeling afraid and they, re, they respond to it by uh, embracing one another, uh, even though the female was actually um, in one of these kind of lovers quarrels that lovers are supposed to have in, in South India. So something happens to the observer. And actually, let me, I think the only way I can answer this question um, without giving another whole lecture, which I'd be happy to do, <laughs> is to say that I'm trying to write a book now about introspection 
in the South Indian literatures uh, from this period, introspection and insight. Uh, and I'm trying to show uh, that um, a new kind of introspection has become one of the diagnostic features of all the expressive domains at this time. This is not the introspection of yogic states of mind or Buddhist meditation or things that we know about, but a very kind of personal insight is based on personal experience, like in the story that I, uh, that I told you. And uh, if you think of the Kingfisher as embodying that movement of a sudden plunge into an, a personal insight, you begin to see how that notion of um, some kind of cognitive and affective change could be reflected in this um, image of the bird that's taken out of the landscape. You know. So I would connect it to insight and to the experience that somebody might experience from the outside watching uh, insight emerge in somebody else. Take one more a question on Nakira's verse on the half fish, half bird. It pulled both inward and outward. I wonder whether this verse relates to the, forgive my pronunciation, akam and puram poetic genres that you've talked about. Is there a special relationship here between the inner and outer realities? Is there a dialect here we could understand with this sort of spatial metaphorics? Yeah. So, um... Yeah, I guess, um, I guess I didn't say this explicitly, although I was kind of hinting at it because I know that there are people in the audience who know about the aham and puram, the inner and outer poetics. Um, there's no doubt that that image of the torn leaf and pulling in two directions also has some kind of resonance with the notion of the relation of the outside and the inside. That part of it, I think, is a given. Uh, it's a part of Tamil culture. Generally, it's an ancient part and it goes on um, right through the medieval period and early modern period into today's literature, it's still there. It's kind of very basic notion, not only in Tamil, all the South Indian literatures have it in one way or another. However, that doesn't mean that it's always the same. This is a relationship which changes over time. And um, I think what I would want to say, I have to put in a kind of simplistic way, is that um, by the time we get to the early modern period, this uh, notion of inner and outer um, is keyed to a new modeling of the way the mind works, a new image of what the mind, the human mind is. Maybe not only the human mind, because there's a question of what the minds of the gods are like and also other kinds of creatures, including maybe trees and leaves and so on. But let us say the human mind, you know, because also the notion of a particular uh, new kind of human being is certainly very much in place. There's no question about that. So what does that mean? Um, I've written about this at some length in my book on the imagination and also a little bit in the book on the history of Tamil. Um, I think what it means is that um, the uh, classical models of mind, which are very rich in India, especially in the Nyaya logicians, these models have given way to a, a new configuration of mental, um, mental activities in which the um, you could say the outstanding, perhaps defining feature of being human, of having a mind at all, um, is what is called bhavana, that is to say imaginative um, operation, the ability to imagine, which means that um, imaginative, uh, imaginative uh, projection, let us call it, or imaginative creation um, has a tremendous potential effect to transform external realities. I know this sounds as if I were talking about some sort of, um, I don't know, um, solipsistic uh, error in uh, Western logic, but it isn't like that. In fact, uh, it's something which needs to be defined in a uh, kind of more uh, satisfying analytical way. Let me just say that if imagination, bhavana is the sort of central defining feature of the mind, and the relation between the inside and the outside has also changed. And um, that's why the old Tamil grammar of outside and inside has shifted in the direction of a kind of, um, how should I say, a kind, of, a kind of cognitive, affective world of the inside and its uh, tremendous transformative 
potential effect on everything that is outside. It's a major feature of this period and one that I hope to address in this book on introspection. Fantastic, thank you. Um, this takes us to the end of our time. Thank you all for asking such great questions and for such great answers, Dr. Shulman. I'll pass it now back to Zev. Thanks, Joe. I'd like to close by thanking Professor Shulman for presenting to us this uh, captivating and enlightening talk and for waking up very early to deliver it from Jerusalem. Uh, although we did not share the same space, it has been enough for us to share the same deep feeling. I uh, also wanna thank my colleagues, Rich Solomon and Joe Marino for their roles this evening. And I also thank the staff for their extraordinary efforts in putting together and running this remote webinar. They've really got it down to a science now. Uh, Jen Miller, Young Yoon, Anna Schnell, and Elizabeth Self. And finally, thank you all for coming and being here tonight. I wish you a wonderful evening. Thank you very much to everyone.